Th thank you very much, Miguel. Um, Dave Rubin, you did a fantastic job, and I also have to congratulate uh, Steve Hanauer and Ed Loftus for really setting up this last session, and I, I fully realize I'm the, I'm the last person separating you from lunch, so I'm going to take that into consideration, and I'm going to take the liberty of changing the title of my debate um, to we must treat the CMV and adjust the therapy for ulcerative colitis in the spirit of creating the consensus as fast as possible so we can get you some nutrition. Um, so I'm going to frame my discussion of CMV in, in this uh, structure. We're going to talk about five things. I want to actually emphasize a little bit about the natural history of CMV because as I also learned a tremendous amount going through this exercise to prepare this lecture, I actually thought I was going to talk about C. diff. So this was, a, this was a surprise when CMV came up as the invitation. Um, but when we think about the natural history of the virus and how it can cause problems, it actually puts things into a lot of perspective. And I think that will hopefully give some take home messages that'll be meaningful so that you can have um, a better handle on CMV when you encounter it in that rare situation where it can be really life threatening. So just some background information about CMV. It's a DNA herpes virus. It was discovered back in the 1950s. Um, it actually causes these very uh, uh, classic changes in the nuclear morphology, these cytomegalovirus ch changes, this increased virus size. The virus is trophic to endothelial cells. So it's actually going to affect the blood vessels um, where it's going to be hitting those end organs. So if we think about destroying a blood vessel, that's going to cause a massive amount of damage. And that's why when CMV becomes CMV disease, you you see these very deep punched out ulcers and your patient's obviously going to be in deep trouble in terms of trying to heal that level of injury. Um, the CMV infections will uh, create a lifelong latency after the primary infection. And the, one of the major reasons we think about CMV is not in the IBD patients, not necessarily in the immunocompromised patients who've gone through transplants, but is the most common torch virus. This is one of the horrible viruses that can lead to stillbirth, horrific birth defects, um, deafness in newborns, and actually the burden of illness uh, due to the uh, infections that can occur in pregnant women has been a major impetus for vaccine development. And I'll actually share with you some good news at the end of this presentation because we're not too far away from having an effective CMV vaccine. So the epidemiology of CMV is going to be transmitted in body fluids. We heard from Dave Rubin that this was a saliva uh, virus that was detected in their 1961 case report. Um, it's going to be readily transmitted from body contact. Um, the majority of Americans have it, and it's interesting, up to 60% of six-year-old children are already CMV positive. It's more common in minority populations compared to the Caucasian population, but by the time people are reaching age 80, 90% of adults have C CMV infection. And this implies that uh, perhaps as much as a third of the infections are going to occur in adults. And that's going to be an important point to remember. The primary CMV infection that is going to be occurring in an adult patient, and that adult patient who's already on immunosuppression for IBD is going to be a special case scenario. Um, and when CMV infections occur, it's going to cause a uh, viral syndrome in more severe situations, it looks like mono. So this is the heterophile antibody negative mononucleosis, not the EBV mono, but a CMV mono. Um, the reason we're paying so much attention to this is because of our colleagues in transplantation. So back in the early days of transplantation in the 1970s, um, cytomegalovirus was called the troll of transplantation. The reason being that it would sort of awaken and arise and actually lead to really devastating uh, consequences in patients. So if we think about CMV and immunosuppression, it can cause horrific problems. Up to a quarter of organ transplant patients back in the 1980s were dying of CMV. And this resulted in our transplant colleagues developing protocols to rapidly identify CMV showing up in the blood. So when we talk about the CMV antigenemia assays, as soon as it would turn positive, those patients who've had a solid organ transplant were going immediately on antiviral therapies. Um, nowadays, we're going to be using PCR screens much more effectively to identify who these uh, individuals are. But this idea of preemptive strategies to try to prevent that end organ damage where we're going to see these um, loss of vascular uh, territories and horrible injury in the patients that would lead to mortality, um, that's really the key issue. And CMV is a problem in transplant medicine, but it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. Now, some of the strategies that our colleagues in transplant are using in terms of screening in the blood are not going to be really applicable to the care of our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, in part because we just don't have so much immunosuppression in our patients.
So I wanted to highlight this study before we go into some more of the specific details regarding the IBD patients. This is actually a very, very nice paper that I found that talked about CMV reactivation in the intensive care unit, not in IBD patients. We're talking about people who ended up on a ventilator for any reason, ARDS, pneumonias. And it turns out when, you did a, when this prospective study was done in France, 16% out of close to 250 ventilator patients actually developed CMV antigenemia. So they actually had CMV reactivate in their bodies during a period of critical illness. So 16% of the patients became CMV positive, and it took about two weeks of illness in order for this to occur. And this really brings home the concept that the sicker the individual you're dealing with, the more important it is to think about CMV. When patients are experiencing milder problems with IBD, probably not as much of an issue, but when they're getting very sick, hospitalized, not responding to all the drugs that we'd like to have work, that's when CMV is gonna be an issue. Now, did the CMV matter in this setting? I would tell you that I wasn't sure when I started reading this paper, but I highlighted this in blue, that at the end of a 28-day time period, the people who had turned CMV positive, only 15% of them were able to wean off the ventilator when half of the people who were CMV negative were able to wean off the ventilator. So in, in all honesty, CMV matters in some level, in some way, shape, or form. And the factors that were associated with the CMV um, acquisition were some of the things we would think about, steroid exposure. Um, CMV actually predisposed to the patients developing a bacterial infection during their hospital stay. Um, so these are, again, important things to keep in mind. Um, Dave Rubin did a fantastic job making this distinction between the infection and the disease. Basically, disease is evidence of CMV in the end organ of interest. In that ventilator study that I just mentioned, the only organ that was found to have CMV was the lung. So the organ that's being hit is the organ that's going to be susceptible to CMV. The diagnostic testing, again, we've already talked about this in some detail. The testing is going to be um, it's going to be a problem of um, um, sensitivity when we think about the biopsies and the immunohistochemical staining and the uh, detection in the end organ. So if you see CMV in a biopsy specimen that's been stained or um, had special immunohistochemical staining and it shows any positive cells, we probably have to take that quite seriously in the person who is sick. Let's talk a little bit about CMV and IBD. Why are IBD patients at risk for CMV? It turns out that pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, is actually going to be a, uh, essentially a growth factor. It makes CMV expand. Um, CMV is trophic to the sites of inflammation, as we just touched on in that ventilator study. And CMV reactivation occurs in the setting of immunosuppression, especially steroids. So if there's one thing you're going to take home from this session, steroids are the bad actors when it comes to all of the infections. Um, the impact of CMV and IBD, I, I know Dave presented some data suggesting it may not be as clear cut, but in general, I would say that CMV infection is associated with worse outcomes, including perhaps more colectomies historically. Again, the data is really patchy, and it depends when we're looking. So we're going to find CMV infections during active I IBD, but the sicker patients, and if we actually throw a criteria for refractory to steroids, we're going to see more and more CMV being detected. We actually pulled some data quickly for this conference, um, looking at our electronic medical records at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, CMV occurred in six individuals in the IBD group um, during essentially a six-year time period from 2002 to 2007, while C. difficile was found in um, 29 individuals. So it's about maybe uh, a quarter uh, of the rate. And some of the CMV patients did okay. Um, there was one colectomy out of six, and the C. diff infected patients actually didn't do quite as well. Um, here's a nice slide from Ed Loftus um, that he had at the ACG meetings this past uh, um, October in San Diego, which actually talked about combinations of infections. So the CMV-infected uh, IBD patients who had C. diff at the same time, they had a 70% colectomy rate, and it was 16% of the CMV patients. So CMV will set you up for a whole bunch of other problems, so don't stop looking for other infections. Um, so the diagnosis of CMV disease, I think, please keep in mind, you're going to be looking at the organ that's injured. So you're going to be doing biopsies. You're going to be looking for um, histochemical staining. And um, that's really confirming that CMV is the relevant problem that you're going to be up against. Actually, we saw that slide, so I'm going to move on. This is what I wanted to highlight. This is what I wanted to highlight. 
I told you that CMV is going to be acquired in childhood in the majority of individuals, but it's the adult patient who actually gets that primary first infection with CMV. If they're on immunosuppression, this is going to be the potentially life-threatening situation where you have to treat the CMV as the first priority, reduce steroids, reduce immunosuppression. Steve Hanauer alluded to this as the systemic illness. This is an infection that actually will result in your patients being admitted to the ICU. I've seen this happen three times in my career. So once every five years, I hear about one of my patients who's in an ICU, and sometimes it takes a little bit of effort to find out what had happened. Oftentimes, I'm, I'm the last person being notified that this has occurred to one of our, one of our patients. So the primary infection in the setting of immunosuppression, potentially life-threatening. The thing that's going to make it easy to detect this is the IgM serology. So if you're suspicious that you're dealing with a primary infection, send off the IgM serology. It's going to come back positive, and it's going to potentially tell you this is the initial exposure. Sometimes you'll actually have a second strain of CMV that could actually cause this as well. And this is where you've got to have the intravenous gancyclovir therapy brought on board rapidly. I completely concur with all of my colleagues. Get infectious disease expertise on board because this is serious business. You do not want to be struggling with this on your own. Here's a case that we saw at UPMC. Miguel Ruggiero and our colleagues at UPMC know this case pretty well. It's a nice 39-year-old woman who had a 10-year history of Crohn's colitis that did fantastic on fairly low-dose 6MP at 50 milligrams per day, horribly ill, medical ICU admission. She has an IgM positive for CMV, 30,000 copies of PCR positive CMV in her blood. She was treated with gancyclovir and actually was weaned too quickly from the gancyclovir and relapsed and got into deep trouble. When you're dealing with this, have your colorectal surgeons on board, have your ID attendings on board to help you out. So the, the key thing here is to back down on immunosuppression as rapidly as you can when you're dealing with this primary infection. Use your intravenous therapies. Um, there is no cookbook approach to this. There is no two weeks and stop. Basically, if you have severe injury in the colon, you have to have proof that you're clearing the CMV from the blood, very akin to what would happen in a transplant setting. And you have to have uh, clear-cut evidence of clinical response before you're going to make a transition to an oral agent um, like the valgancyclovir. So recurrence of latent CMV infection in IBD is the most common scenario. This is much more akin to what uh, um, Dave Rubin was telling us about. And again, we don't have perfect data in this setting, but using a combination of approach, if you've done the scope, you've identified the uh, CMV in the end organ, you really have to treat both issues. You have to treat the underlying inflammatory bowel disease. I completely agree that the anti-TNFs are probably going to be our best choice in this scenario compared to steroids, but you also have to treat the, uh, the CMV infection as well. So it's not going to be an either or. Here's the algorithm um, that was published in the um, um, ECHO guidelines in terms of diagnosing the infection and then bringing on expertise, treating the anti with antivirals. So this is where we're going to wrap things up, the future directions for CMV and IBD. So the Institute of Medicine actually has made CMV vaccine development a priority because of the burden of illness that results from the, the torch infections in pregnant women who have children who have suffered these congenital problems. Um, due to the CMV, and also the growing transplant, solid organ transplant population that we have um, um, in the U.S. and throughout the world, and patients who are actually benefiting from immunosuppression for chronic inflammatory disorders. So there's a clear need for a better approach for CMV. For 40 years, CMV vaccine develop was, was stalled, but I can actually share with you that there's been a lot of progress. So before I came to this meeting, I went to the clinicaltrials.gov website, and there's a um, uh, phase two development for a, a compound called Transvax, which is actually showing some very, very positive results in studies that have been done in the hematopoietic bone marrow transplant population. And here is an infectious, Lancet infectious disease article, which actually shares um, some of the findings in the bone marrow transplant patients. But basically, to summarize this, the patients who were vaccinated had about half the rate of CMV-related problems. CMV would come back, but their body would be able to clear it much more readily, much more quickly, much more effectively. I'm going to wrap things up. Um, so cytomegalovirus is a common virus, which has the potential to cause severe illness in the setting of IBD immunosuppression. Primary infection, that's the IgM positive serology leading to end organ disease in immunosuppressed IBD patients is life-threatening.
and it requires rapid decrease in immunosuppression and definitely treatment with intravenous gancyclovir. And documenting viral clearance is essential to gauge antiviral therapy in this setting, in this primary infection setting. Reactivation infections are much more common, but we also do need to have documented evidence of CMV in the tissue during that active patient who's being sick admitted to the hospital. And again, sicker patients warrant that higher uh, vigilance to look for this problem as a complicating issue. Um, look for and treat other infections in the hospitalized refractory IBD colitis patients because C. diff actually hits CMV patients at a higher rate than we would expect. Involve your colorectal surgery colleagues because no one likes surprises, and it's best to have your team on board from the start when you realize what you're up against. CMV vaccination in the hopefully not too distant future is going to be available, and it will help to prevent this, and then we won't have to talk about this as often here at the uh, uh, advances meeting. But really, the bottom line is this. Both the CMV and the IBD colitis have to be treated. Infections exacerbate IBD. I think that's pretty clear cut. Anti-TNF agents may be a better choice in severe IBD colitis patients with a superimposed CMV infection compared to steroids. Thank you so much. Thank you.